Welcome to the Doctor's Debrief Podcast, presented by NDMD Productions and hosted by me, Vivian McCool, first year medical student. Here on Doctor's Debrief, we're going to take a dive into some of the most impactful patient cases of a physician's career, the ones that are forever imprinted in their memories and have played a crucial role in shaping their identity as a physician. Although all of us have experience with facing and overcoming adversity, we seldom talk about the skills we use or the lessons we learn along the way. That's why, here on Doctor's Debrief, I'm passionate about being transparent about these hardships and the methods we use to overcome them to encourage others to follow their dreams and learn from every step of their journey, regardless of their circumstances. I'm your host, Vivian McCool, first year medical student. You can find my YouTube channel in the link in the description below. And with that, please help me welcome today's guest. Today's guest is an obstetrician gynecologist who is a member of the Medical College of Georgia, the Gold Humanism Honor Society, the Student National Medical Association, and the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. She's trained in both obstetric care and surgical management. She earned her bachelor's degree in medicine, health, and society with a minor in biological science at Vanderbilt University before going on to receive her master's degree in biomedical science at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. She received her medical degree at the Medical College of Georgia before going on to complete her OBGYN residency there where she earned Resident Teacher of the Year. She also has previous experience as a researcher with publications in an array of prestigious medical journals. You might recognize her from a previous 73 Questions interview on this channel, where she discussed life as a chief OBGYN resident while she was balancing a career in medicine as a new mother. So welcome the one and the only, Dr. Ayanda Bullard. Dr. Bullard, thank you so much for agreeing thank to be for here today. Me. I'm so excited I'm to so be excited. back in Augusta and be back here. So really? It's, yeah, it's, it's been good. You're, you're excited to be in Augusta? Well, <laughs> we have, we, to say this, we have a, um, a house here still because my husband's in residency. So it's, it is nostalgic to ride around. I'm in Atlanta now, so there's l- less traffic. So that's helpful <laughs> when you come back here. Honestly, that's probably the a major plus to this to this. Oh, town. absolutely. Absolutely. So before we get to the thick of it, is there anything that I missed that might be of interest to the bright students listening or watching? That was perfect. I said, wow, (laughs) you make me sound cool. But thank you. (laughs) That was good. Thank you. Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm so honored to be here. I'm so excited for this interview. Andy had nothing but good things to say. And I just, even from before meeting you and before getting into med school, I watched your 73 questions interview. And I just like, just like the energy you gave off on the video, you're like the same in real life and you're so easy to talk to and yeah same very, very same cool. for you too oh well, thank you so speaking of that um interview i was a huge fan of that episode and i was really inspired by like your women-centered take on OBGYN. do you think that played a role in you choosing that specialty oh absolutely i think i was raised by a lot of strong women my mom is phenomenal she's my best friend i call her like three times a day thanks Aww. mom um and then my grandma is much the same and she actually was a tech up on labor and delivery for years in the period of like racism and segregation and all that type of stuff. And so um, she kind of would tell me all those stories and that kind of got my mind wondering about uh, women's health in general. And so this was a a natural transition for me to want to continue to carry the torch for that. Okay. Sorry, everyone. No, (laughs) don't don't be sorry. This is TJ on the bottom. (laughs) <laughs> making an appearance making his comeback so why do you think you were attracted to medicine like initially like what I think you? I liked the tactical part of it uh my mom was really good about putting me in enrichment camps when I was younger cool. so I was that nerdy little <laughs> middle schooler who went to the science camps looked at the microscopes looked underneath the microscope did research in in high school all kinds of stuff that um little kids might be doing if they were into science and I like really ran with it from there and so um I'm one of those people when I find something I'm just like streamlined focused on it and that's kind of how I got into it It was really my mom showing me something I was interested in that's super cool that's super cool too because your mom doesn't particularly work in no she doesn't I don't know I think she got me my first microscope when I was like seven or eight I was pulling hairs off the dog and looking at the hairs underneath the microscope and so she I don't know 
it was weird. She just like supported yeah, that. She like she saw what she you saw, liked and she was like, which, which I think, go. uh, as a, as a mom myself, I always am looking for little things that, you know, my son is interested in. So now he loves to sing. He has a microphone. I sing with him. So she was doing what any mom would do. It's just kind of fostering your children's, um, passions from an early age. Yeah. Love that Future pop star right there. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> so now that you're settling into the attending life, mm-hmm. are you happy with this specialty? Oh my gosh. Yes. And this is for you too, because I remember being an M1 and thinking like, what am I going to do that everyone tells you to keep your, your options open, which is absolutely important. But I came in knowing I wanted it to be an OBGYN. And so that's also true too. Like stick to what you are, stick to your guns as well. Like don't be swayed. And um, I just think that now that I'm on the other side of it, I remember days where I'm like, this embryology is weird. I don't know if I wanted to be an OBGYN. <laughs> do I need to know that a blastocyst or Morilla, are these words ringing a bill? A little bit. Yeah. Not do a I, fan of embryo. Yeah, <laughs> it was horrible. And I didn't think, I was like, I can't be an OBGYN because I have to know this. And I actually switched to wanting to do cardiology. Oh, so God. I was the head of the cardiology interest group. Really? In med school. And the publication I had in med school was from cardiology. And then I ran into one of the older seniors at the med school, and she had since become a resident at um, MCG. And uh, she said, oh, you don't have to know all those details. I was like, thank God. <laughs> and, so, and so I think I would tell my younger self that, like, on the other side of it, it gets better. Like, okay. and people always said that, and people are still saying that to me. It's, it's a transition point. It's not a... Um, a one-stop shop, but it, it definitely has gotten better. Um, I come home all the time. I tell my husband, like, this is cool. This is really cool. Cool. I'm glad I did it. Good. I'm glad to hear. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that you're happy, and I'm glad to hear that it does get better. Yes, it does. It, it really does. So what turned you off from cardiology after that? So I was the first doctor in my family, and I actually thought that cardiology was a residency, right? So we're actually, you have to go do internal medicine, And then you have to do a fellowship, which is cardiology. And then I wanted to be an interventional cardiologist, which is even more time. And I said, I don't have that time. (laughs) And so I had gone and shadowed one of the MCG attendings in internal medicine. And a lot of it was just titration of all the meds. And people had so many different comorbidities. and, Mm -hmm. And it just lost my interest. Honestly, I said I couldn't do it. I couldn't do an internal medicine residency. So I went back to OBGYN. Cool. Well, it sounds like you landed exactly where you like, yeah, needed it was, to be. Yeah, it was great. So that brings me to my next point. Unlike most medical specialties where patients come in because they're suffering, um, OBGYN is unique because people typically visit you in preparation for like the best yes. day of their lives. Yes. Like they're, they're in pursuit of creating or expanding their family. And it's it just is different energy. It's such a energy. fun job. I think recently I've gotten into it, uh, especially being in a bigger city. People are elaborate. And so it's such a fun job where people are excited to come get their ultrasounds for their baby or find the, the gender. Yeah. So now I've been asking people, what did you do for your gender reveal? And so I recently had a patient who bought a helicopter and or got a helicopter to release the fairy dust and the color of the gender no. and stuff so it's that's amazing it's fun we rejoice with each other we Aww. cry with each other so it, you feel like you're part of their family you literally yeah like i remember in your 73 questions interview you were like i remember giving birth and like that moment was so special yeah. and like you it, you described it as a privilege mm-hmm. to be it on is. the other side and it help really bring life into the world too yeah. it's it's so cool. so so cool i wish people could just have like a, a back seat to what we do um, and I think that's what drives a lot of us to do what we do because it's not easy work, but it's yeah. it's so fulfilling. It's so fulfilling. It's not easy. And it's like there's also like the dark flip side to like when things go Ari, like mm-hmm. in the labor and delivery room. And it goes from being like the happiest moment of someone's life to like the most traumatic, which yeah. is why like your role in that healing is so important. Mm-hmm. Um I know it might be hard to pick, but what would you say is one of the most impactful patient experiences that you had? One I can think of because it just came back to me. Um, Well, I had a patient who I was unfortunately delivering who had an IUFD, which we call an intrauterine fetal demise. And so she had gotten to be about 28 weeks, 30 weeks. So she was pretty decent along in her pregnancy, but not quite to term, of course. Mm -hmm. And, um, we that's part of our job right we deliver 
you know, full-term healthy babies, but we also deliver babies that are sick, and it's always heart-wrenching. But in this delivery in particular, as the mom is pushing, she's screaming and crying, and the baby had passed. We all knew this, but she's reciting the Lord's Prayer. No. And that was just so gripping to me that I've, I'm usually stoic, not, not to the point where I don't relate to the patients or empathize with the patients, but I try to be strong just to not waver one way or the other. Yeah. But I couldn't hold back the tears as I was delivering. And I think that that moment I realized, well, not realized, it reaffirmed to me the just how much of humanity is in in, in our jobs and how it's okay for me to feel, you know, it's okay for me to show emotion because things are horrible or sad. And so I bring yeah. that story up because um, that happened while I was in residency. So one of my past um, junior residents texted me this week and said she now has had another baby full term. It was, it's great. She has her child now that she always wanted, but wow. it was, it was just in the moment. I just remember being like, wow, this, this is hard. This is hard. And for me to be able to be in the room and be some form of support for her was a privilege, but also kind of daunting at the same time. Wow. Yeah. God, no, that's major. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so she knew, and I mean, what, like an act of strength, like. Yeah. I'm, she luckily, she had great support um, from her family and her husband was very supportive, but it still doesn't take the away the sting. And then the other kind of horrible thing about it she they were waiting for the delivery to find out the gender and so once we pulled the, the baby out and said the gender she kind of cried again and said what the baby's name would have been and all that type of stuff so that that was striking and jarring and that's part of our day and, and the crazy thing is you go into the next room for a happy delivery and you have to turn that off you know yeah. and so that that is not often which thank god is not um because some other specialties that's a, a a frequent occurrence where you're dealing with death like in the cancer um, fields or maybe in the er or something like that but at least in our job most of the times it's a happy a happy time yeah the opposite yeah. of death yeah. usually mm -hmm. so like the other day i saw like a video on like youtube or somewhere that when people give birth to babies that like didn't make it and like they have to go through that process. They're they're gifted like a box. Yeah. Or something. So some hospitals do that, and ours that at least in residency we give them like a box with the um a little hat that someone actually goes and hand knits for the premature babies if they're early. They also give them the box, and the family always likes it. They also have people who do little heartbeat bears. So if there are babies, you know, that will likely pass right after birth, they will record the heartbeat um, and then put it in a little stuffed animal bear so that the parents can, can have that with them as well. Wow. That's really cool. Which is cool. very sweet. It's very cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is super cool. Yeah. So how do you think the, that experience with that patient who like was reciting prayer during her delivery how do you think that experience shaped you as a physician going forward? It was so early mm -hmm. in your career. I think kind of as I was saying, it just gave me grace to feel what I feel and not feel ashamed that I have emotions too. Um, so that, that helps you better connect with them as well when you're not trying to be the solid rock in a hard place, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I found that I'm able to let my hair down a little bit more because I think patients need to see that, that like, hey, my doctor realized how much of a traumatic situation and she was there in the trenches with me. Yeah. Even despite her being sad or upset or she was still there, she could handle it. Um, and so that that's kind of what I've taken from it. I was thinking that like yeah. it almost help, helps you like connect to your patient more. Yeah. Because you're like showing them like I'm human, like mm -hmm. I'm not just you're not just another no patient you're like mm -hmm. an actual person yeah. and like i see you and i feel yeah. with you absolutely that's beautiful how do you think that experience shaped you as like a person i think that it just i and i've always thought every child is special um but personally and i'll say this but i've never um i've never had a, a loss of a baby right and so I just think it's shaped me in realizing like how powerful women are um, because I think that it's very hard to lose a child at no matter what state. 
Um, but just seeing that, seeing her do that and then getting pregnant again just kind of reaffirms like my thought about just how much of a badasses we are. Can we say that on Can we say that? Okay. <laughs> um we're 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 powerful. We're um amazing, amazing on all aspects. And so um that kind of shaped how I feel about us. It basically just said we can do this. Anything. That's awesome. Yeah. I love the women aspect of OB, like GYN. Yeah. Like I love that all the you're around them all day, mm -hmm. like just like a girls' club. I go home and my, I mean, I really am a chatty person by nature, but I feel like I've just hung out with all my friends. That that's how my job is, that's and that's cool. that's really cool. And you're like taking care of them, like you're and hanging out your patients. I yeah. think the difference between residency and attendingship is that sometimes in residency they're coming for the hospital system, mm -hmm. if you will, um, because you're a doctor assigned to this academic institution. Whereas in private practice where I am now, they seek you out, they look at your reviews, they want to get to know their doctor, they want you to get to know them. And so it's a lot more of that interpersonal connection that I have with my patients now. That's really cool. Yeah, I love it. It's great. That is super cool. So a lot of places I've heard like will debrief after difficult mm -hmm. cases and stuff. And I know a lot of the time, like you said, it's like rapid fire and you have to like switch that off and go and be happy with the next patient who's mm -hmm. bringing in a child. Um, how like how did you debrief or cope after that? Um, I just into. I guess I really didn't. I cried in the moment, kind of told my co-residents about it, and actually my attending because this residency was in the room, so we we shared commentary about it. Um, but mm -hmm. that was about it. But for other cases where there's a lot of moving parts, that that one wasn't a big. Um, moving part situation because it was just a delivery, a vaginal delivery. But sometimes we have medical emergencies where let's say there's a trauma coming in and like we have to move quickly. Everyone's got to get to the OR. You got to get the NICU involved. Like there's so many moving parts that we often do debrief after that to make sure, okay, did you get the call fast enough? Did you get this fast enough? How can we be better the, the next time? Yes, baby. Okay, guys, well, if you've been hearing some some little chitter-chatter and seeing some fingers sticking <laughs> up at any point, we got our we got our little cast member with us. Everyone say hi to TJ. TJ, wave. TJ, say hi. Say, look. Say hi. Yeah, Hello. perfect. High five. There we go. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, where were we? We were talking about... The whole debrief process yes, and yes, you yes, were yes. saying that um, if it's multifaceted, if a lot's going on, you yeah. kind of check in and make sure like, did we, we all do it we, the best we could have? Yes. And like, yes. how can we improve going forward and stuff? Mm -hmm. Which is very important because we're always learning from each patient. No one is just the number. And so every situation is different. And so we learn different ways to be more efficient with each new person that comes in the door. So I really like that we do that. No, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So what skills and resiliency do you think you developed, I guess, not just from that case, but any cases that you kind of had to reflect on after? I think, and this also probably goes back to more of me playing sports. Like, I, I play sports. I have three brothers. What sports do you play? Um, basketball and tennis. Oh, cool. And so this has always been what I had to do. If I ever had a bad game, I'm like, okay, it's just one play. It's just one, one set. You just keep going. Don't let that affect your day. And so I've always carried that with me even before um, medicine. And so I see that now even more when I get in the OR. So let's say I get into a C-section, there's a lot of bleeding. Okay, don't freak out. Go back to what you know. Get your head in the game, whatever. Get this patient safely out of this OR, out of the situation. You're doing great. Um, and so, no, that's okay. Eat your cracker. And so I think that um, residency has also reinstilled that in me. In the way that I transfer that over to my patient's care. Um, and so you could actually ask a lot of my colleagues to say, Ray is really just cool, calm, collected. And that's where it comes from. You have like a powerful inner dialogue. Yeah. And you wear so many hats so well. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, thank you. Mommy, mommy. Thank you. Yes. Great. Look at I'm the movie. like yeah. so impressed. No, literally like you are a role model. That's very sweet. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep it together. Have you seen those memes where like the mom has the hair all on the side <laughs> and that that is us, but he's my little ride or die and he he's definitely taught me resiliency just as a mom really? and carrying that over um to my practice. Moms moms are crazy. Parents in general. You learn that. You learn that. Yeah. Ride a wave. Mm-hmm. 
I could. I don't know if I could do it. You could. You could. <laughs> Maybe not right now, but you could. <laughs> uh, um, so before we move on, was there any any other parts of this case or any other impactful cases that you'd like to share with us? I think that is the main one. There are others, but it's similar points that I've learned from it. But that was the main one that I feel like really stuck out and changed me as far as my character. Okay. Um, but yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. That story was moving and I appreciate your honesty and willingness to share with others the difficulties that healthcare professionals have to overcome. But before we wrap it up, I want to ask just a couple more questions sure. for um, future medical students watching or possibly future residents yeah. who are watching. What is one piece of advice that you'd give to a prospective medical student watching or listening right now? I would say it's still important to get into it for the correct reasons and just make sure you've explored everything. Um, I think that when you ask little kids what they want to be, you'll hear like police officer, doctor, fire, fire, fire fighter, excuse me, or those big jobs. And there's such a big world out there. There's so many different things you can do. And this job is one where it takes times where you know this is where you're supposed to be and you know that you did it for the right reasons where the money doesn't matter. You know, the, I guess, it's not fame. What am I trying to say? The um, appreciation the okay. and the prestige of it doesn't, won't matter. It's the fact that, hey, this is what I've always wanted to do and I want to help people. That's what's going to make you stay up. That's what's going to make you read extra for the case. Um, it's those little intrinsic things that no one can give you um, that will drive you further. Okay. Uh, and so I think that that's what I would tell any M1 because they're smart, right? You got into med school, you're um, competent. Most people, the passing rate is pretty high in med school if you think about it. People yeah. do fail, but you will become a doctor. Yeah. And so you, we just need good doctors. And that's what I hear from a lot of my patients is, oh, I've never had a doctor do this. I've never had a doctor do that. Now, maybe their reality was off or their perception was off, but it's really important that we connect on a human level. And some of that means you're doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. yeah. No, I I couldn't agree more. And I think that so often, like you think you have to be like the smartest or like the hardest no, working yeah. when really it's just like you just have to care yeah. and like genuinely be there for those right reasons. Exactly. Being a genuine yeah. person. So you recently got out of residency. Yes. So I feel like you're going to be like a phenomenal person to ask this. Yeah. What are some things that you would suggest to people in medical school to like stand out for residency applications? I would say just being a whole applicant, meaning like you have extracurricular activities, um, you um, have good, good um, letters of recommendation okay. that they're like, strong because i know i think yes look the goldfish look great i know with the recent <laughs> changes in like the boards the step one oh, yes, where they're not pass great fail where they're pass failed that wasn't my reality and so i had those different um benchmarks that people could use to kind of um um trim who they wanted and who they didn't want so now they're which is good i think it's good that we're moving towards the whole applicant so just making sure you're doing things outside of the classroom okay would be what i would say Okay, that's great advice. That's yeah. great advice. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Bullard. I really appreciate it. Such a pleasure. And I guess with that, I'll wrap it up. Well, it's been great being here. TJ has gotten to eat a, a load of snacks. He's been <laughs> excited about it, but thank you for having me. No, thank you yeah. both for making it out. I'm honestly honored to, to be in TJ's presence. <laughs> Is it good, TJ? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, so cute. <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much for watching the Dr. Debrief podcast. I hope you enjoyed the stories, lessons, and perspectives shared today. To make sure you don't miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the NDMD YouTube channel or whatever streaming service you choose to listen on. And please don't forget to comment and like while you're at it. Also, Dr. Bullet's coming out with a YouTube channel. I am. Actually. I am. The first episode comes out tomorrow. So it's called Hey Ray's World or at Hey Ray's World is the tag. But the name of the vlog is Ray's World. So, so be looking out for that. That's going to be linked yes. in the description. Yeah. And make sure you go check it out. Yeah, please do. It's, Follow, it's, like. It's going to be crazy. Comment. Yes. Smiley faces. All the things. Thank you. Subscribe. But okay, with that, we'll see you next time. Say bye, TJ. Wait, bye. Bye. Yes. <laughs>